Hey everybody, it's that Sunday School Girl of thatsundayschoolgirl.com. Welcome to the lesson for this Sunday, March 12th. I hope that you had a really great week. I I just don't want to talk about mine. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. The absolute best thing about it is this moment with me and you together right now. And in my heart, there's a celebration bubbling up because this week is almost over. And the really good news is, I don't have to do this week ever again in life. And that right there is enough to just make me fall out on the floor and just have a happy fit. But anyway, seriously, it is the weekend. I trust that you have something really great planned with your family. And I don't want to talk about my weekend either. But I'm going to just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And there's just one more week left to spring break. Like next week when we come together and I make this video... Like, I'm going to be like happy faces and bunnies and puppies and the sun is going to be shining. In the meantime, about that weekend I don't want to talk about, the man said snow here tomorrow. It's knocking on spring's door and we're getting snow. That said, while we're in this weekend, do not forget that we are springing ahead. So go ahead and think about getting those clocks set on time for Sunday morning. Now this, this is my least favorite Sunday of the year because there are going to be people who have good intentions and they just, I'm not going to give you an excuse, but it's possible that, you know, some people will miss class this week just because of that whole alarm clock thing. Don't let one of those people be you. We are springing ahead and springing into Sunday school. So be there, do something great with your family, be safe, enjoy it. Hey, if you're new around here, welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. I am like pumped that you are here. We, I keep saying this because it is true. We are growing. I get amazing messages every week that people are finding the channel, finding the website. So you know how this is. I want to be your best friend in Sunday school. So mark the site, that sundayschoolgirl.com. Download my app so you can have Sunday school on the go. Your daily readings are all there. The weekly lessons are there. And from time to time when there are specials from the TSSG store, I let my app friends know first because you're absolutely a special group of people. So make sure you have it. And from time to time, there are specials that are downloaded in the app only. So you want to be a part of the special crew. And since we're here on this video, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss any of the awesome content that comes out on this channel. Two things I want to let you know about before we get into the lesson. First of all, uh, for the last couple of weeks, if you are a friend of my Facebook page, which I hope you are, or um, you have my website bookmarked, which I hope you do, you have seen that I have shared the work of Aisha Frazier on my page every week. She is a phenomenal young woman from the state of Kansas who has started to do a comic every week of the lesson. It is her, her ministry, her talent, her skill is incredible. And she does them as a black and white printout. It's a printable that you can just pop right off and take to your class. It works incredibly well with young people. It's just a different way to bring the lesson to life. And it does it in such an age appropriate way. So check out her work. I think we typically upload it sometime on Saturday. So make sure that you friended the page, but most definitely intentionally, y'all know I love intentional living, intentionally look for that comic. In fact, go back and take a look at her last two weeks of work. And since we're just getting into a new quarter, it could be a really cool way uh, to start something with your youth classes and maybe allow them to start uh, maybe the comic book for this quarter. That could be a really cool, cool, cool idea. Last thing I want you to know is that if you are a subscriber of the quarterly T, SSG box when we are in a new quarter. You are watching your mailbox for something fun and something cool and I want you to know that you will have fun and smiles this week. Boxes will ship on the 24th of March and so if you are not a subscriber you're missing all the fun. You're missing great stuff and every quarter there's a box of goodies that are sent to Sunday school teachers around the country that are just uplift and just fun and things that you can use very um 
tactical things that teachers would love to have. So if you have not signed up, you want to know what it is, you want to send a box to a teacher or a friend just to be an encouragement to a teacher somewhere, check it out on the site. It's really, really fun, and I promise you're going to enjoy the box. Listen, that's it for me. Let's get into the lesson and talk about it for this week. Depending on your publisher, your title could be Great Love or God's Overflowing Love. The Bible basis is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. The Bible truth. Believers are called to live in unity and maturity as one body in Christ. Our memory verse is verse 5. And the lesson aim is that we will validate that God's love addresses the separation of sin, give thanks for his grace which offers new possibilities for living in human community, and proclaim God's love in the world and in our communities. We are in week two of our spring quarter, and thematically, all quarter long, we are going to talk about the fact that God loves us. Like three little words that carry such a big idea. And let me just be honest, like those three words are enough for me to close the book and lay on the desk and cry because God loves us. He loves me. And no matter what I've done or if I've disappointed him in any way, he loves us. And all he wants us to do is love him back. I may have mentioned this last week that as humans, we are designed to desire love and we're designed to give love. But the best model that we have for what that should look like is the love that God has for us. And it is such a big love. It's such a sacrificial love. And we see that woven throughout the text that we will study in this quarter. Now, this week we are in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is written by Paul and he wrote much of the New Testament writing to different churches, different types of people, different personalities. Mentioned last week that his writings can sometimes be very fatherly. Um, but like a parent, like you know that you talk to different children in different ways because they either have different issues going on or they just have different communication styles. So sometimes you'll see that Paul is writing um, as a corrective action or there's been some bad behavior in a community. In Ephesians, this is basically an exhortation to a church. And an exhortation is more of a persuasive writing. He's trying to um, encourage them by a strong and stirring argument, um, an admonition, some advice, or an appeal. But he's writing to a church that is on fire for Christ. And it's interesting that he's writing to um, advise them when he himself is in a situation that isn't really great. Like he's in prison and he is in prison for being accused of starting a riot. Um, he was in a city and there was a prominent uh, silversmith who made little articles of worship and his business was tanking uh, because people weren't buying the little articles of worship anymore because they were converting to Christianity, receiving the message of Christ. And I mean, who was there preaching that message? Yeah, it was Paul. Uh, and it was kind of his cycle. He'd come, he'd preach, somebody would get angry, he'd run him out of town, he'd end up in prison. He'd do his time, and when he'd go back out, guess what? He'd go back to preaching again. So not uncommon that he does what he does, and that was, that was simply sharing the message of Jesus Christ. But it got him in trouble, so he's writing from prison. In our lesson today, we'll see that Paul is going to talk a lot about God's like divine plan for salvation and why it was given, and how interesting when I look at the fact that Paul can write so passionately about salvation, because you have to remember that he himself had received such a tremendous gift. Paul, even though we look at this great writer who was so influential in the New Testament, you got to go all the way back and remember that Paul was old Saul from Tarsus. And before he was converted, before he was a Christian, he was a really bad guy. Like he persecuted Christians. That was his sole job. And what he did, he did it big. When he was after Christians, he did it in a big way. But when he was converted, he did big things for God. So I say often that God doesn't necessarily take out those things in our personality uh, that are unique to us, but he finds a way to use those in a way that can bring him glory. And that's what he did converting Saul to Paul. And Paul had a tremendous career and ministry as a missionary. Now, his writing sometimes can be uh, very personal in nature. You know, he talks about himself. He talks about the people. He wants to know how they're doing. 
He shares about his own life, but this letter to the church at Ephesus is a little bit different and it's more formal in his nature. And he's dealing with the topics really at the core of what it means to be a Christian and not just to say I'm a Christian, you know, not just wearing a bumper sticker, not just a t-shirt, but every single day, what does that mean in your faith and what does it mean in practice and how do you do that regardless of what's going on in the community around you? Now, it's interesting because sometimes we don't really appreciate how good something is unless we've known how really bad it is or how bad it could be. And so in his writing, uh, Paul tends to write in contrast to help us see what it is God has done. So he uses a compare and contrast form of writing. And in this particular text, like he is just smashing people with the truth. And we see that because, again, the contrast in writing, if you go back to chapter one, he opens up talking about Christ and how all that we do is for uh, for Jesus and it's all about God and from the beginning he shares that you know it was God's plan to have mercy and toward us and grace extended to us this was really his purpose and he ends on this really high note in chapter one talking about the great and mighty power uh, and the position of Jesus Christ and then all of a sudden we flip to chapter two and like we do a 180 and we're in a whole nother place. And, you know, Paul starts to say some really bold stuff, like right out the gate in our first three verses of printed text. He says some pretty big things. Um, he talks about our purpose and he shares an idea that's big. But in a sense, it's kind of hard at the same time when we've just compared this awesome creator. We've got the awesomeness of God, the awesomeness of Jesus Christ in chapter one. And then here comes kind of this smack in chapter two that starts with this idea of you. You, meaning you and I, people compared to the awesomeness of God, we're dead. Like that's what verses one through three say, that we look at the state of man, that man uh, was dead in his trespasses and his sin. Like that was the bad news. Out the gate, here's the bad news. We were dead. And again, if you, compared to chapter one, this is a stark contrast because in chapter one, he calls them saints. And he's written so nicely to them. They're not just saints, but we're saints with every spiritual blessing, chosen ones in Christ, predestined for adoption. And now we're in chapter two and you were dead. What does it mean to be dead? It means that you can do nothing, incapable of producing anything, in a rebellious state. And you were dead and lost in trespasses and sin. We were basically death walkers, living dead. When was this? When we were walking outside of Christ. And if you think about death, like there's no such thing as being sort of dead or partly dead. And the other piece is that a dead man cannot resurrect himself. He can't will or bring himself back to life. So he talks about man's state. The condition of man was dead when he was separated from Christ. And what was it that caused a dead situation? It was two things, trespasses and sin. And I hope you have your pen out because these are, these are words that you'll want to pay attention to. Dead, trespasses, and sin. What are trespasses? Well, trespass is really a legal term and really means to go beyond where you're supposed to be. And it brings injury to another person. And so when we've trespassed God's law, we have gone beyond where the law gives us boundaries to be. It means that we've offended God. We have uh, executed a lapse of the standard that God has set. And then sin itself is that which goes against the law of God. It displeases him. It means we're in bondage when we're in sin. We've missed the mark. And so he says that the state of man was that man was dead in trespass and in sin. The second thing, and we're still in verses one through three, is that we see a description of man's world. He talks about a world where you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. So we walked according to something else as our guide, like something is always vying for our attention. Something always wants to lead us. Something is always we're always following something in the past. What he's saying is that we patterned our lives after the standards and the definition of the world. Those are very different than God's standard and what God defines our walk should be. So we are to make. In fact, it takes a conscious effort to follow God. Like when we roll out every day, you get out of the bed. The Bible tells us that in our 
flesh lies no good thing. So our default nature is the default to flesh. It's default to the world. And it takes a conscious effort to put your mind. Uh, in fact, the seasoned saints used to sing a song, put your mind on Jesus. And those are very conscious behaviors because the world has a set of standards that are its own. It defines what's hip. It defines what's cool. As a matter of fact, we are now in a society that compromises its own convictions and the lines really seem so blurred. And that's really one of the biggest deceptions of Satan, that there should be no spiritual concern that we should have. And so um, he's talking about a consciousness of not walking in the standards of the world. The third thing that we see is the description of man's heart. This is where man was. Um, among them was this idea that man lived according to uh, his flesh, the lust of his flesh, his own desire, the things that his mind wanted to do. And every single one of us at some point has lived according to the desires of the flesh. Now we, we kind of have some extremes as to what we think that that means, but that simply means that we are all born with a sinful and fleshly nature. And by our default, we desire, we crave things that we just want to do. And we just want to do it because it feels good. And again, it takes a conscious effort to run the analysis and say, does that please God? Is that what God would have me to do? And the, the caution is that we have to caution against being self-righteous because self-righteous people are the ones who often fall into their own hype and their own sense of really they're easily deceived because they fall into their own hype. And so when Paul writes, he says that these are lusts that we were formerly in. If you look at the word former, it means it's part of our past that we were uh, formerly known as lust livers, but now living in Christ, Christ produces righteousness in our lives. And righteousness is nothing that we can accomplish on our own, but through him. It doesn't mean that we never mess up, but it means that we have been made right with God. And through our relationship with God, we always understand that reconciliation and how we can maintain that righteous standard with God. All of that, all of that kind of slapping in verses one through three, but it was for one reason. It was because God loved us. Verses one through three really explain to us the condition that man was in. And when we fully understand that condition, a dead condition, a condition incapable of producing, a condition that man himself could not change, a condition that was dead, then we can better understand the significance of what it is that Christ did for us, what it is that God did in making sacrifice of his own son versus Four, five, and six talk about that. And it talks about the fact that God was rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead, even when we were in a situation where we could not produce and we could not change ourselves, he quickened us together with Christ. And by grace are we saved. He loved us so much that in a dead state, he sent the sacrifice of of his son, Jesus Christ, to allow us to experience the grace that could save us. We could not save ourselves. We could not revive ourselves, but grace saves us. We are saved by grace through faith. And we'll see that in the text printed. What is grace? By definition, it is the divine influence upon the heart. It's an unmerited favor of God. It's something that we can't produce. We couldn't earn it. It was something that he gives to us. Paul uses the word for, F-O-R, 11 times in Ephesians. We see it first in verse 8, and we'll see it again in verse 10, but they're used very differently. In verse 8, we're going to see that Paul starts to talk about the purpose for all of this. He's really explaining the reason. Why would God do this? Why would he design the salvation plan in this way? And in verses 8 and 9, you should have your pen out because you're going to note six different things. God could have saved us many different ways, but here's how he did it. First of all, by grace. What is grace again? The divine influence upon our hearts. Secondly, the mechanism by which it was done through faith, through our faith is how it happens. Faith is essential. Faith is a gift that we have. It's given freely, but without it, we don't have salvation because it takes our faith to receive that. So it's by faith through grace. The third thing is 
It's not of our own. It's nothing that we could do on our own. It's not of ourselves. Remember that a dead man cannot will himself back to life. He cannot bring himself back to life. And so it's nothing that we've done on our own. But point number four says that it is the gift of God, a freely transferred gift. The, the gift giving is complete. The transfer is complete. And it was his gift to us without condition. And it is the result of not of any of our works. It's not anything that I can do off of a checklist. It's not how many uh, church activities I participate in. It's not a list of works. Nothing I can do on my own. Point six is also that I can't even boast in it. This is, I can't take credit for it, but it is all for his purpose. So by grace, through faith, not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not the result of works and it's not so that we can boast, but it is all to display God's glorious grace. But that's not all. It's not just what God does in us, but it's also what happens after we receive salvation. It is so much bigger than just a decision. The decision to receive Christ is fantastic, but our lives are to be purpose-filled. And that's the second four that we see in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, and I love this scripture, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. God is our master designer. And if you like designer things of any sort, you know that when designers make something, they design it for a purpose. And not only is it for a purpose, but they want others to see it. And so our lives design, master designed by God, are designed for purpose. And he wants the world around us to see him in us. It takes us knowing his will. But if we're going to know his will, we have to ask him what it is. But we are created in Christ Jesus and we are created for good works. Again, that's not a resume, but good works is about being a difference maker, a game changer in the places you hear me say it often, where you live, work and serve. When you show up because you bring the light of Christ with you, the love of Christ with you, you ought to change environments and change atmospheres and be a different kind of producer just because the love of God is in you. The last thing I'll say is this, and we talked about it last week, that God initiated love. Love was his to give, and we are the recipients. We are the responders. And so we should be conscious about how we live that out, how we reflect his love in our lives every day. Here are my key learnings from the week. This week's lesson gives a very clear description of the plan of salvation. And we have to watch out because there is this misconception of being alive when you're actually dead. And so we have to consciously know that there is um, a difference. It's not just enough to be a good person. It's not just enough to be kind. It's not just enough to be charitable. We have to do all of those things, but it is possible to do them all and still have no connection with God. It is a conscious act of receiving by grace through our faith. Sometimes it is good to remember who we were prior to our conversion and just how much we needed salvation. And it gives us, in my mind, a different sensitivity to others as we help others and encourage others through what they may be experiencing. But most of all, there is a humbleness that it allows us to walk in every single day. When you remember uh, past things or remember not so much the past, but what God has brought you from, the purpose is not to beat ourselves up, but it's to look back and you realize that God is so incredibly awesome. Like that is a humbling wonder when you remember all that God brought you out of. And again, it allows you to serve from a different place of humility. The lesson helps us to look at who we were in our past, who we are in our present, and who we will be in our future. So we're always in this growing and becoming kind of state. Like as Christians, you never arrive. Like there is this, there is no, you know, destination that calls us super wonderful Christian and we never have room for growth. But we're always working towards that future, better state, better versions of ourselves even. 
The world is not the thermometer by which we're to judge our lives, but we are called to know God, called to know him in a very personal way and called to represent him according to the standard that he has set for us. We believe in a risen savior and that should impact how we live. We can say no to God with our words, with our actions and our deeds. So again, we have to be conscious because what we believe dictates how we behave. And God loves us. That's the message that we're getting. But the question is, what are you doing to love God back? We're going to continue to talk about love. And you will continue to hear me say that no matter where you are right now in life, no matter what you've done, no matter how long you did it, no matter who you did it with, no matter who knows that you did it, I want you to know that God loves you. And God will never love you anymore then he loves you at this very moment. And all we have to do is accept that love. And when we accept his love, we are better able to show his love. That's our lesson for the week. I hope that you have fantastic classes. You already know if you have something that you've gotten in your study this week, we like to share. So leave me some comments below. Share this video with someone. I really think that's it. I've got to run. I got class. Y'all have a great weekend. I will see you in Sunday school. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye, bye.